You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane. We're here talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona and the freeze-thaw cycle. It's starting to happen. So at least my backyard at my own personal house has, I'm starting to feel a little bit of crunchiness underneath my feet. The front yard's on the south side. Yeah, it's fine. It's thawed. I mean, plants are actually, the plants are still growing. My ivies are still growing. Uh, Pansies are in full bloom. Uh, Things look really good. On the north side, I've got a a two-and-a-half-story house. It's like a classic built-in mountain home with a view, basement dugout below. Uh, There it hardly sees any sun. And so where I'm seeing that shade, I'm starting to feel the ground freeze. It's just, you can break right through it. I was planting some pansies back there just to dress up a little bit more color. So when I look out my office and I'm doing garden columns. I want something inspirational out there. So I've got something to look at some color. The birds like it. It just helps. So I'm feeling a little bit of crunch. I'm going, okay, that's that. That's an indication. That's a start sign. That's a signal for some winter projects that you want to get done. And so that that's uh, that when that ground starts to freeze and then thaws and then freeze and then thaws. And that happens about uh, the end of the year, through January, mid-February or so, uh, the ground will freeze and thaw like that. When it does that, the ground becomes very fluffy. We call that heaving. So the, the ground actually will, will eject rocks. You'll just, it starts to change. You'll see this fluffiness. And then in the spring, you'll, you'll start to compact back down as you walk on it. Well, that heaving is a great thing for wildflower seeds. It actually is a natural cycle. So your plants, a lot of your echinaceas and gallardias and poppies had said had spewed it, shut out seed everywhere. As this ground heaves, it swallows up those seed and helps them germinate the first warm day in spring. That's the natural cycle that happens in the mountains of Arizona. Well, if you know that's the natural cycle and you can work with the environment instead of against it, all of a sudden you can use that to your advantage and spread wildflower seeds. Now's the time when you do that. You do that in midwinter. You want to spread that seed out so that it actually will heave. It'll actually absorb and, 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 and receive and take in. It almost grabs the seed and pulls it under. And so it germinates better. So you'll have a better germination rate next spring. There's some techniques for ensuring that you get better germination, a better show of wildflowers. But this is a winter project. This is something you do now through January. The next six, five, six weeks, this is your timing for wildflower seed. A big mistake many folks will make with their mountain gardens, these are mainly flatlanders, folks coming from tropical climates, you know, the deserts, where they're thinking, oh, it's May. I feel like gardening. I'm going to go spread some seed out. And now I'll have this wonderful wildflower package. Oh, it'll be so nice. La, 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 la. And they wonder why they fall flat and go, nothing came up. What the heck is going on? These mountain gardens. It's just not what I'm used to. It's, I must have black thumbs. No, no. You just didn't get with the cycles. You just aren't working with the environment. You don't know how colder climates receive seed into the ground, especially wild seed. Many of these seed need to to freeze and thaw, uh, especially poppies, things with a large hull to them. Uh, They need that freeze and thaw cycle to crack that outer shell of that seed so the seed can actually germinate. If you take just a poppy seed and you go out in May and you spread that around, you go, oh, I'm going to have poppies, it's going to be so pretty. Uh, it, it, it doesn't have that freeze thaw. And so it just sits there and waits. It doesn't come up. It can come up next winter or the following spring if the birds don't eat the seed first. But there, there's a reason that nature has this freeze and thaw cycle. You'll get better germination rate by doing that. Now, we can cheat, and if you want poppies, you, I can teach you how to plant those in May. And generally, what it is is you naturally, you, you well, artificially, uh, force the seed to crack open. So you'll take that uh, package of poppy seeds and you'll throw them in the freezer for a couple of days. Then you'll bring them back out. You'll let them thaw. You'll throw them back in. 
let them freeze again. So that freeze, that expansion, and then, then that shrinking, then expansion uh, causes that shell to crack open. So you'll get a germination rate next spring. But why go through all that work? Well, you could do it yourself just by putting them outside early where we still have some of this freezing temperature. And it's only going to get better as we go into the our, our winter solstice, I think is what is that next week? It's coming. We're almost to our shortest day of the year. Uh, so, so now through January is when you want to be doing this where that ground freezes and thaws. That's also, can I do the counter to, to that? Wildflower seeds, they like that. They need that freeze and thaw and that heaving of the soil to receive the seed. And, and, and it helps your germination rate. Things that don't like that. This is a reason like two months ago I was saying it's time to mulch. You want to add a layer of compost, especially around the roots of things like roses, your uh, smaller shrubs, things like salvias, potentias, things that, 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 that heaving, they don't like that. Those plants have been rooting down and they've got deeper roots than just that first you know, two, three inches of layer of soil. But those few soils, those that soil, the roots in the that layer, top layer of soil, they can get heaved out and actually pushed up out of the ground or broken. Those roots are broken off, and so you'll do some damage. So by putting a two to three inch layer ring of of, of mulch or compost around that plant, it keeps that ground from heaving, and so the the, the roots stay intact. This is really important for fairly new plants. So you put a new tree in and it started to root out and you put it in last summer, okay, July, June, May of, la of this year. And it's rooted out and it's starting. It's got some deep roots, but mainly it's got shallower roots. And if that soil heaves back and forth and expands and freezes and thaws, uh, you can damage, you can, you can break off some of those fine root hairs. As that tree matures, less of an issue. With fairly new trees and new root hairs, these are very fine. It's like a hair, like a person's hair growing through this ground. If it heaves, it can break that off. And so if you simply put a two, three inch layer of premium mulch, you don't want not really manures so much because that can be too hot sometimes, but a composted material is great. Uh, um, ground up leaves. This is a great opportunity to take those leaves out of a drop, rake them up. I generally will chop mine up with my mower or, or a, a, some sort of vacuum or some, some way chop it up, especially big leaves like sycamores, maple, some of those. I'll chew those up. Then I'll, you, you can use that as insulation. Anything to keep, to add an insulative layer over that root so you don't have as much heaving. Uh, so that's some things that can really help you. And I would say, in, in order of priority, put some more mulch or topsoil or something around those those new plants, that's, a, that's important because it's starting to heave. And then at your leisure, when you've just, you've just had way too much eggnog and you're just feeling a little bloated from that Christmas dinner, oh my gosh, and you just want to get outside and enjoy some fresh air or get away from the company or, or, or whatever, you want to be outside, it's a great time to be spreading wildflower seed in the yard. And we'll go over... So we've only got a minute left in this segment. Let me, I've got set, let me set the stage up for Lisa to come in. So Lisa Waterslink coming in with your garden questions. Get through that. Maybe at the bottom of the hour, or I'll give it a, a, a whole segment unto itself on how do you exactly plant wildflowers. There's a technique. It's like five-step program, and it just ensures you can spread it out there, get germination, and keep the birds off of it. If you take some shortcuts, uh, they don't do as well. One thing I can tease you with Whatever you do, don't buy wildflower seeds and just throw them over the over your embankment and go, wildflowers will grow up there and my erosion will all be solved. It doesn't work that way. You got to take a few more steps than that because wildflowers need more. It, yes, some would come up, but 90% of them would not. And if you've ever checked the price of a good wildflower seed, I'll actually go over that. How do you choose wildflower seeds? There's some that are better, some that are good, some that are terrible. Just stay away from at all cost. We'll go over that. But you still, you want a good seed? They're going to be fairly expensive. You're know, ten bucks for a pound or whatever it is. It's it's it's. You'll need to. You want all of it to germinate. So we'll go over that. So a lot in store this show. 
Lots of garden tips, tricks, and advice, but you have to stay tuned in. Be right back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio with your garden questions. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. Okay, maybe after decades of the same fruitcake exchange, it's time to start a new holiday tradition. A living Christmas tree from Waters Garden Center can be decorated and enjoyed for a lifetime, not just a season. When the holiday festivities end, gather family and friends and plant your tree together for years of enjoyment. Or Waters will plant it for you, guaranteed. As your family tree grows, have a tree that grows with your family. From Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Hi, Lisa here with the plants of the week and our sunshine daydream abelia. Pink and white flowers continually cover this brightly yellow shrub. Very pretty. Requires less maintenance than all the other cultivars with a compact, creamy foliage. At $34, it's a garden designer's dream bloomer that takes heat, wind, and blooms even longer with a bit of midday shade. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love easy perennials, love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Okay, we are back in the studio. We've got Lisa Waters Lane coming in with your garden questions. Just what are your neighbors talking about? What are other gardeners Asking, sometimes you just don't know where to begin. So that's what this segment was all about. Welcome, Lisa. Glad you're Thank here. Thank you. Always good to be here. Yeah. So this week, yeah, we got to go pick up our graduate. <laughs> she's not, well, I guess she's a somewhat of a graduate, but not a... She's in grad school. Right. <laughs> I mean, you're overanalyzing. I was just, dang, mama, our kids, you're <laughs> our smart. You're smarter than we ever dreamed of. <laughs> you always Speak want, for yourself, You dear. only want what's better for you. Yeah, that's true. In our family, you are I do have the most educated. Master's at, well, not anymore. No, James, James is the same as you. Has a master's degree. A PA. I have a master's degree. Has a master's degree, not a yeah. doctorate. But he's pretty now. darn smart. Oh, he's smart. Just <laughs> I just like him to think I'm smarter than him. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to watch them all grow up and mm-hmm. and and start doing stuff. So right. you had your master's degree in counseling and employee. It's counseling uh, and human relations. Oh yeah, human relations. Which, anyway, yeah. it's HR. Pretty generic. <laughs> <laughs> in the small business world, that's HR. Yeah. No, it's good. Yeah. I got it through NAU. Their program actually stayed here in. Prescott, and then got it through NAU, through their programs here. Yep. So, and then we met at ASU, go Sun Devils, and we've had none of our kids went to U of A yet. There's or still ASU. time. Or it That's true, Well, <laughs> That's true. Yeah, okay. Our oldest daughter went to NAU. Yeah. So, but yeah. hey, you never that's know. That's it is. So, garden question, enough about our kids and their education. So, okay. bragging rights. But what do you have? Anyway, went over, I guess, where do we loop back around? Uh, went over, she's going to Fuller Seminary. She's going to get a family therapist mm-hmm. degree, grad school. So she started this this semester. Mm-hmm. It's a two-year program. So we went over to drive, came back. We went to play over in L.A., went to watch Wicked, and then went to Pine Dinner, kind of celebrating, going, hey, oh, sure. good start. Keep going. One quarter down. Yeah. A bunch more to go. It was the uh, carrot, so we don't have to use the cattle prod as much. And well done. <laughs> <laughs> She's really enjoying it, but it's yeah. always it's always fun to go do stuff with your kids. It is. Grown-up kids. Yeah. What questions we got? Well, our first question is from Doug in Prescott. He wants to know, is it too early to be applying dormant oil for his yeah. pines, or can he do it now, or is it better to wait? Generally, we say after the new year. So that's when you do, when it's cold, peak, peak of the winter. But you know what? The aphids have been so bad this fall. Mm-hmm. I think you. I think earlier is almost better, so you can't go wrong. Generally, we say to wait on the dormant oil to, until after you're done pruning. So you prune your roses, you prune your fruit trees, you prune your your yard, you just clean things up, and then you hose down the yard with dormant oil. With his specific question, Doug, you're doing evergreens. I'd say you could do it right now and be no worries. 
You could do your fruit trees as well at the same time, but really it's, it takes more. So if you could prune it back, get that mm-hmm. canopy back a little bit, open it up, mm-hmm. then spray it. You won't have as much, won't need as much spray, but Hey, if it's all mixed up in the, in the tank, go for it. You can't, right. it can't hurt. It can only help. And the reason you're u- using the all season spray or dormant oil, the oils is it's a heavy grade oil that coats the surface of the bark it kills any any eggs that were laid. It actually suffocates them, so it's all organic. Any insects, you'll be amazed how many insects are actually wintering in your in the bark, in around the tree at the base. So it kills off insects and their eggs. So at least you're starting next spring clean. That's the goal. You do everything, roses especially, things where you see bugs, you've had bugs. That's what you spray. Okay. So go for it. All right. Well, you talked about pruning, and that kind of leads me to my next question, um, and that's from Eileen. So she had maintenance people come in to clean up the yard, yada, yada, yeah. yada. Pruned back pretty severely her lilacs and her forsythia. Uh, so she wants to know, is there anything she can encourage, do to help them encourage set more blooms, or is it just kind of this oh, is the boy, year that's you won't hard. have them? Yeah, first of all, take your landscape guy who was not a – he's not a horticulturalist – I mean, just just take your hand, take your take the leather <laughs> glove off, and slap him upside the face, you idiot! So he pruned off the buds that were forming since last summer. So that's where buds, uh, camellias, rhododendrons, azaleas, forsythia, lilacs—they all bloom. All the spring bloomers—they form their buds starting months and months ago. Mm-hmm. Do, is there time to recover? Probably there's time to recover some, but you won't be back to where you started. So generally, we prune those spring bloomers after. After they're done blooming, because if you prune them now, you you cut the buds off. So you start over. What could you do to help stimulate more buds or the buds that are left to get them as large as you can? Here's what to do. Take some all-purpose plant food. It's an organic food that we make here at the store. It's 744. That cottonseed meal in that will lower the pH and increase the, the bud count. In addition, I would get some super phosphate. That's exactly what you want. Super phosphate. I would sprinkle some of this around and water it in really well. Super phosphate is 0, 18, 0. That middle number, that, that, that middle number is for buds. You want more roots, more buds? That's what you put on it. Well, put that on there, water it in really well and pray hard and talk to your plants and touch them and maybe they'll form some buds. It will definitely, that two, two-pronged approach, all-purpose food, Superphosphate will increase the flower show of anything next spring, but especially if you've had a blunder like that, it'll maybe help you recover. And then maybe consider shopping around for a new maintenance guy <laughs> that might not be so stupid. It just that's just ah oh, drives me crazy. Yeah. I think that's that's that. It's good to be home sometimes when they're doing yeah. the maintenance oh. so you can kinda keep an eye on them because you're right. A lot of them don't know. All they know is trim everything back. Yep. And Mow they, and blow. They don't know. So. Yep. There's some really good ones out there. They're yep. really bright. And there's some that they couldn't get a job, but they owned a pickup truck and a shovel. So now they're in maintenance. So you just, yeah. you got to know who you're, what they're doing for mm-hmm. you. Yeah, that's frustrating. Or get out there and supervise. Supervise. That's a good way to go. <laughs> supervise. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Our next question is from Janice. She wants to know if she can apply wilt stop on her Alberta spruce and hollies. Will this provide any benefit this time of year? A wilt stop. So yes, we should explain what wilt stop is. This is a, this is a sharp gardener. So you know what they're doing. So they must've gotten it for wilt stop is an anti-desiccant. That's the actual name for in, in gardener terms. Or it keeps the plant from getting brown leaves, from damage. And so, yes, there is definite uh, a benefit to doing that now. What, what it is, it's a clear coat. It's kind of like sunscreen or lotion for plants. So it locks that moisture in so it doesn't dry out as quickly. And it keeps the frost off so you don't get as much winter kill or winter damage. So your winter evergreens would definitely benefit from that. So wilt stop on evergreens, great idea. Uh, for things that are dormant, don't waste your time. It's, if it's already dormant, it doesn't have any foliage out there exposed, it's not going to get damaged. There you want to water a couple times a month. That's what's going to keep your deciduous stuff, things that have lost their leaves. That's, what it, that's what's going to keep them healthy. For your evergreens, 
as we get colder, as we get further into January, a month from now we'll hit our coldest day, and that's when the damage can happen. It doesn't usually kill hollies, doesn't usually kill Alberta spruce, but it can damage the tops. The wilt stop will totally take that out so you're not having to think about them, especially if you've cut that irrigation off. Mm -hmm. Let's say you haven't watered since November. It's been two months. <laughs> and shame on you. <laughs> it's, it's We haven't had that enough moisture to keep things moist enough. Right. So if you've got that, water by hand, but the wilt stop will really take the edge off. Or if this is your second home, your summer home, and you're going down to Phoenix and mm -hmm. that's your winter home, it could really help because you don't know what the weather will happen to us up here. So it helps take that edge off. We always have a bottle or two of wilt stop. Mm -hmm. We have, I have the concentrated form. I mix up in a pump up sprayer and that new growth in spring really helps right. my winter evergreens uh, really helps for the winter. And then we put it on our cut Christmas tree. So mm -hmm. we'll spritz that and it just ensures that we've got, uh, no matter how warm it gets inside, it makes sure that that, that uh, plant does not dry out till we're done with the parties. Right. So great questions this week. All right, Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners will be right back with more after this. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Arizona Gold Euonymus. An excellent choice for colored hedges and as tough as they come. This evergreen displays bold gold, head-high foliage that grows even thicker when sheared. A single shrub makes a bold statement for just $27, but in rows they make excellent visual and sound barriers. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love bold gold hedges, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Red Clusterberry Cotoneaster. Stunning white flowers cover the shrub in spring, then form red berries. A large evergreen that is tough, easy to grow, and tolerates poor soil. So thick when sheared, it's the perfect privacy for hot tubs, secluded entertainment areas, and prying eyes for just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love red-berried Ketoniaster, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So wildflowers, we were talking, and we started out the show with that. I want to really go deep into how do you spread mountains. The mountains of Arizona especially are famous for our wildflowers coming up spring, and they pulsate. They come out in waves. So you'll see your poppies, and then your gallardias, and then your echinaceas, and then you're, you'll see this wave of different kinds of seed coming up and bloom at different times. Of course, that's how flowers work, isn't it? So that's how you plant a flower garden is you have something that'll be showy and then it'll fade then something else will come in to show. So you're strategizing how to have uh, continual color, not the same color the whole time, but different pulsating waves of colors of different flowers. That also ensures a couple things. It keeps, if disease comes through and takes out your, whatever that, the poppies, well, then all the gallardias will stay intact. They'll stay there. So they'll, they'll actually, so, so disease goes after a certain strand or a certain flavor, a certain style or color, but it will keep, if you got diversity, it helps you. Wildflowers, they know this. So when we create blends or wildflower mixes, so I've got an Arizona mix. It's I created it years ago for here. It's all the seed you'll see growing on the hillsides. I've got a fragrant wildflower mix. So that little patch off the back a patio. You want something wild, something natural, something English garden looking, but you want it to smell good. We created a mix of just wildflowers that have a fragrance to them. It takes a little bit more water to get those because generally there's larger flowers, but uh, it's easy to do when it's smaller, close to where you can, can, can take it on. Uh, there's a lot of places here in the mountains that are shaded. It's actually surprisingly difficult to grow wildflowers in the shade. Most flowers need sun to create that photosynthesis to make the flowers really produce. But there are some. So we created a mix 
It's mainly they just grow in the shaded areas of your garden. So if you're in the pines or the north side of your house or underneath that big maple tree out front, you can grow a wildflower patch with just a specialized shade mix. And so there's different mixes. I've got deer and rabbit mixes. I've got um, you know, resistive mixes, butter, butterfly and hummingbird mixes, some that just more tubular shaped flowers. There's different mixes uh, as the point being. They're made for here. So be careful of the fancy packaging. Here's what you'll find, especially at the holidays. Gardeners love wildflowers. If you know you got a gardener that's a great stocking stuffer, they just think it's the greatest thing ever. Well, some of these manufacturers know this, and so they'll make a pretty package. Be a canister with a pretty wrap on it, lots of bright colors, pretty wildflowers. When you really look at the seed, uh, it's 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 annuals. They aren't perennials. They won't come back every year. So they seed once and they're done. Well, if you're going to do wildflowers, you kind of want a good perennial mix. So they do that because annual flower seeds are cheaper. They're, they produce more seed faster. And so and then what they'll do is there won't be very many seed in that canister, and it's mainly filler. It's mainly perlite or vermiculite's the main one they seem to use. So it's a whole lot of filler in the can and. They barely sprinkle any seed in there. So, but vermiculite sort of, kind of looks like seed. You spread it out. Uh, it's just it's made to be ooh and ah and and affordable and a big thing for a small price. And here they'll buy this and we'll put it on an end cap and they'll buy it. It may not be the best mountain variety seed for the higher altitudes. So we make our own seed here, and so we got our own mixes, and so they're not as fancy, but you can see the seed. You know what you're getting. So it's and it's a pure seed. So we've even got a a meadow mix, a native grass mix. So Indian rice grass, blue gramas and buffaloes. And then we add some shorter flowers. So we had a wildflower mix with grasses, but the taller grasses would shade out the flowers. And so all you'd end up with was just grass. So we we go, okay, let's just go with short grasses and flowers. Now it would get us more of a meadow look. And so there's a lot of flat spaces that it's not for mowing made for viewing, but low growing grasses that maybe you mow, you know, weed whack it or mow it once a year kind of thing. So there's different seed mixes for different purposes. We've got a, a wild grass seed mix. I created that one probably 20 years ago, mainly for those folks. So you put a new septic field in, or you had to make a cut to widen your driveway or you, the scars of construction. My contractor buddies were, were wanting some something wild that could spread, kind of hydromulch, and it would come up and quickly make that area recover uh, so they so it would look good. And it would, they wanted wild grasses. So it has tall wheat grass and the shorter buffaloes. They've got different kinds of grasses in there. It's, it's more like what you would see driving on the side of the road. It's that grass mix. You treat how you plant these is the same. The seasonality when you plant them is the same. Uh, it's just which do you want color? Do you just want grass? How much? What do you want? What look do you want? And where is it going to grow at? That's what you're after. So I'm going to go into the exact mix. You're going to need a wheelbarrow. You're going to need a shovel. You're going to need a bag of mulch. You need the mix, the, the right uh, wild flower. And I'll show you why you want all those things and the one, two, threes of how to actually mix all that for a great wildflower patch. Got Lisa coming in. We've got to get her ideas on gardening. I heard word. She's doing birds. That could be fun. And then I'll come back and go, just we'll go right in 10 minutes straight. How do you plant wildflowers? Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. These tulips are delicious. We're the cutest mule deers, and we just ate Mrs. Smith's flowers. (laughs) We avoid Mrs. Johnson's because she has native plants from Waters Garden Center. She's got bright red sage, sunny blanket flower, hot pink gara, and a lot more. They grow like crazy in local soil, and she hardly ever has to water them. Hummingbirds and bees love natives, but they taste awful to deer. I sure hope Mrs. Smith doesn't figure that out. Go native. Waters Garden Center. 
Look, if your wife, mom, or dad wants a sweater for Christmas, get them a sweater, not some piece of plastic. But if someone you truly care about loves her garden, a gift card to Waters makes perfect sense. Next spring, she can pick out exactly what she was hoping for. We all know it's not the same thing as a huge hanging basket or a fragrant rose, but hey, it's winter. Gardeners understand. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Also at watersgardencenter.com. All right, I have one of my favorite people in all the world. One of the smartest gardeners I know uh, is in the studio. So it happens to be my wife, business partner, Lisa Waters Lane. I know that she's grown up in the business. So your father, uh, Harold Waters, is the founder of Waters Garden Center. Some people ask, you know, what? How can I, Lisa, come to own Waters? Why don't you own at Lane's Garden Center? Going, well, because <laughs> it's way more special than that. So it's Waters Garden Center. It's family heritage. And so you grew up here jumping around on manure piles and mm-hmm. doing whatever kids do in a nursery after school. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the original location was over off of Plaza Drive. And there were quite a few rocks back in there. So, yeah, I was always climbing on the rock piles. And there were some native grapes that grew up over those rocks. And so wow. in the summertime, you'd be looking for grapes. And Did you ever uh, hide behind the grapes and throw a dirt clot at one of your sisters? Um, or is that just a boy I, thing? I- <laughs> I'm thinking that's a boy thing. I'm sure we did other things. We did all the time. I don't remember that one. But yeah, we played on the steer maneuver bags. I'm sure I smelled this horrible most of the time. But yeah, I was yeah, always playing kids. on the steer bags and yeah. having fun. So that was your built-in daycare. The family business <laughs> nursery was, kids, get out of here. Go play. Look for snakes. Go yeah. get out of here. Well, being the, yeah, I was the youngest, so... There's three years between me and my next oldest sister. So she was probably in school and with me, they were just Ah. like, go play. Because we actually at that time had a pet store in the garden center as well. There's a story. And my mom used to groom. She was one of the groomers in the pet store. Ah, gotcha. And you groomed as well. (laughs) Or you just tortured the lizards or the uh, plucked the feathers out of the birds or something. Did not. No? Okay. Yeah. Boy, boys are boys are more physical. You're, you're kind of uh, mean. You're coming up with a lot of things here that I would never even think of doing. Well, all guys, boys, let's see if, we used to shoot BB guns at each other. We just let's see if you could take this. Like you can't shoot up above the waist. What are you doing? You can puck an eye out. Your mom always. Boys are. That's surprised we lived. Boys, Women are more uh, thoughtful, mental, smart. mental torture. <laughs> Yeah, mental torture, yeah. <laughs> mental torture. Oh, brother. Just kidding. Anyway, this is you. You're yes. saying we go on and on about what we used to do as kids oh, and frighten ourselves. I, I was good. I'm hearing stories about you that make me very nervous, though. So, Oh, you, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> anyway. Anywho, so today I wanted to talk about birds. We talk about a lot about birds and landscaping for birds in the summertime. Yeah, what to plant and that kind of stuff. Well, a couple of days ago, I walked out the front door and this bird comes flying out of our akibia. That's by so yeah. we have a mirror with some. It's almost like a trellis type thing, and we have an akibia or chocolate uh, white chocolate flower vine growing on. It's gorgeous. Um, still has leaves on it right now because it's kind of in a protected Never warm green. area. No, Anyways, the birds love to nest in it in the summer. And you know, raise their little youngins, but was surprised to see come one come flying out of it this time of year. So it just made me think about your landscape or your yard. How are you taking care of those little birdies um, in the winter time? That's good. No, that's great. And it's kind of warm there. It's it's out of the wind. It's a thick vine, very thick evergreen, mm-hmm. uh, five leaf akibi. It's got five leaves come out of each node. Uh, and so birds do like that. And then there's flowers underneath. It's just pretty. And it greets right. you. It's got, it's, we've trained it to go around a huge mirror. So it looks like you're looking into a secret garden <laughs> and then you're in it kind of and thing. You it's see a yourself thing. and you go, <gasps> <laughs> no, okay. Yeah. But anyway, it made me think about the bird and you do, I wish I was more of a bird person that could actually identify the birds beyond a goldfinch and a, I don't know. That's about Nut it. Hatch. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing by by call. Cuckoo! Cuckoo! I do what know kind of crows. bird was that? <laughs> we have lots of crows that are anywhere. I can identify those. But just the mini and and I know more more 
people are more can identify them much better than I can and what's hanging around in their yards. But things that you can do, even in the winter time when those little birds are out, and it doesn't necessarily have to be putting out a bird feeder, but that's important to do. Uh, but just different things in your landscape that it can help those critters through the winter time. So what are some things you came up with? Well, the, the first thing I learned, and I did not know this, there's some birds, and I don't know if they do it here, but they actually will lower their metabolism, their, their heart rates, to almost like a hibernation state. Oh. But that way they don't need as much food, right? Sure. Because their heart rate metabolism is really low. It's downright cold outside. I so know. tuck one foot underneath your feathers, <laughs> put your head between <laughs> underneath your wing, and hang out in the junipers yeah. or I the kibia. We may not get cold enough here if that happened, but I just thought, thought that was really interesting. Most time, you know, they're fluffing up their feathers yeah. or they put additional feathers on in the wintertime. But, of course, they need to eat. So those birds... They're looking for food because it's getting kind of scarce right now. But any of your, your natural berry, your juniper berries, pyracanthas, catoniasters, a lot of them will eat those um, from the, your yard. A lot of them, the blue jays like the acorns and different things that yeah. come off the oaks. Uh, so a lot of just natural things that they can find in the yard if you're not putting out a feeder because maybe you got javelina and you don't want to encourage yeah. those. <laughs> um, you can leave your wildflower seeds, uh, your echinaceas and rudbeckias and those things that produce seed. You can Instead of cutting them back right now, you can leave them where the birds can get to them. And they really like that. Good idea. Um, also from the grasses. The seed heads from the grasses are another really good way for them to have, to have food. And, of course, water. They need water. Now, in our yard, we actually have two sources of water. Yeah. um, Because we have a pond in the backyard. And in the front yard, we run a a fountain on there, which we pretty much... Do we shut that down for winter time? No, it runs your I switch when it comes on. So right now it's on a timer, of course. It's a little it's a piece of granite with drilled through with the water mm-hmm. bubbles up over it. And the hummingbirds love it in the summer. Right now right. it's the robins will come around. Mm-hmm. You'll see them a whole flock of them. Rob nothing but robins. They'll take turns bathing in this in this bubbling water that comes mm-hmm. up. So we run that mainly just during the day, so don't get ice all over it. Right. The pond, I turn everything on during the day. So it's yeah. got a water feature. It's a big pond with a water fountain and all that stuff. So the dove love it back there. The quail mm-hmm. love it back there. So the right. big birds seem to like the big mm-hmm. water source. Yeah. The smaller birds like the smaller, yeah. uh, more intimate one up front. It's a little the one up front's a little more protected. It is yeah. too, so it's got trees around it and shrubs. So right. it's probably a little they feel a little safer. They there. mainly <laughs> like the foliage. They hang out in the foliage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lots of big trees, lots of evergreens uh, for them to hang out with, so they feel safe. And then they'll run in, mm-hmm. play in the water, and then run back, or they'll root around the leaf molds and mm-hmm. around the plants looking for insects looking for things, things underneath mm-hmm. the you know worms that right. kind of stuff i saw a bee no. out foraging on the pansies just really? there's a big it's a male bee Probably just really real slow, slow. <laughs> yeah really slow like he was like drunk or something i don't even know where to begin i just yeah. uh, i'm just here because i'm hungry right right yeah so if you do have your uh bird bath out this time of year be really careful either put a water heater in it or you don't want that water to freeze and thaw in there because it will crack your, if you have a ceramic uh, right. water bird bath. So yeah. be careful of that. Um, or maybe you dump it at night, then you fill it with water, fresh water in the morning. I mean, there's ways around that, but you just don't want to leave water in there all the time because you will get that freeze thaw. So we have a lot of folks that buy a saucer, a big mm-hmm. glazed, heavy, uh, like right. container saucer for. Mm-hmm. winter right. uh, water bird baths. Yeah. So it's a great source, great way to go. Definitely, definitely. And then shelter. They need the shelter as well. Shelter for a couple of things. One, when it's really cold and blustery, they will huddle in there to stay warm with each other. So giving them that shelter. Um, the big trees in the yard can help create a wind break so they're just not getting that full force of wind on them. Um, the other thing it can do is help Protect them from the bigger birds, the hawks that are because they want to eat too. (laughs) But it gives them a place to hide and and get some protection and some warmth. So, you know, getting some big spruces in there, some junipers, um, especially if you've got a yard where everything's going dormant and losing leaves and you've got nothing. You're not going to have birds with that. You need more foliage coverage mm-hmm. to have the birds hang out in the winter at least during the right. summer it might it's different but right now it's a whole different kind of kind of bird set that yeah. comes through yeah. than in uh, than in the summer mm-hmm. no 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 uh, hummingbirds right now 
Some uh, people have hummingbirds that stay year round. We that's never crazy. Have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but some people, you talk to them, they're like, "Oh yeah, I've had one all year." Maybe it depends on how cold the yeah. winter gets. I don't know. But just having think about some of those shrubs you can get in your yard for them for the winter time, mahonias, things like that. So, great advice. So mm-hmm. foliage, water protection from the mm-hmm. wind and things they feel like they've and then keep some food sources up like some of your galardias echinaceas rutabecchias mm-hmm. out where the seed source they're using that to help themselves yep. great advice and we can help you with more because we've got all those things here at waters garden center be right back with Tina lisa lane and the mountain gardeners The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden experts and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on shop, and choose personal garden shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The personal garden shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Okay, as promised, I'm going over how to actually put wildflower seed into a mountain garden. Your timing, we already went over that now. Now for the next six weeks is your peak time for spreading wildflower seeds that will germinate next spring. And they'll come up in waves. So a certain variety will start to germinate, come up. It'll start to grow, and then the next variety will germinate. It's all temperature-related or light-sensitive related. So it just depends on the seed. Also, the size of the seed makes a difference. Larger seeds will take a little longer to germinate than the larger ones. So that's why you have a mix. So you're doing garden mixes. You're putting them down now, and this list that I'm going to go down, I pulled this off of my website. So every time I teach a class, I create a handout. So kind of the notes. These are the garden notes. So you go to watersgardencenter.com. You go at the very top. There's a tab. It's called Learn, L-E-A-R-N, Learn, like learning. Uh, click that Click that tab, then you go down to Garden Tips. That's every time we create a class, that's where the handouts go. One of the handouts is wildflowers into bloom. So that just go, go look for wildflowers. It'll be right. There's a one page document. I'm going to read off of that, not read it. That'd be boring over the airwaves. I'll kind of go in deeper than what that handout is. But if you want the handout, that's where you go. Waters garden center, learn, look for uh, garden tips. There it is. Uh, but there's several others in just that it's how to grow asparagus or potatoes or trees, the top 10 plants, evergreens. They're all there. Every time I teach a class, that's where it goes. And wildflower classes, this is a popular one because they grow so well. Number one, the space you want to grow wildflowers in, rake it. Don't rototill. This is not a garden space. These are wild flowers. But these seed are not going to germinate over a rock pile or in a root debris pile. Or you kind of want to do a little bit of work. And what I'll do is take a stiff tine rake and just, just rake off that area. It also opens up the earth so that it receives more of the seed. That's a real easy way. So rake that off. And some of you will have have a mountain of rocks when you get done. And some are going, oh, this is so easy. Oh, it's more silty, easier to work with. But you want to open up that earth. If you just throw wildflower seed down, they aren't going to germinate or they won't germinate as well. By opening up or scarifying that earth, it's going to receive the seed better. I'll have a wild, I'll have a, a, my wildflower mix. I'll have my wheelbarrow there and a bag of premium mulch. We make a, a mulch here at the garden center. We screen it down real tight. So it's a real fine compost and it's a real fine particle size. So it's perfect for this, for any kind of spreading seed. It's perfect. The problem with many wildflower seeds is you can't see them when you spread them. They're so tiny. So by mixing or creating my own hydro mulch, it really helps me see visually where I'm going to spread the seed and it helps my germination rate, keeps birds off. It's a lot of benefits. But I'll throw that bag of mulch in the, in the wheelbarrow. I'll sprinkle my wildflower seed in and then I'll blend that all together. In fact, frequently, actually every time, <laughs> I like red. I'm a red guy. I'll, I'll buy some, I'll get a mix. I'll kind of supersede it with a red 
mix. So I'll influence my red flowers into that mix so I have more red poppies and red, more reds. And you can do the same. You can create your own custom blend. Take the core that you find at, the, at your garden center and then add a few others that you just like. You, I love California poppies. Take some California poppies and kind of front load it so you have more poppies. Real easy, but sprinkle that all together. Now you're going to blend that mix, whatever that mix is, whatever makes tickles your garden fancy. Blend that all together. Now instead of spreading the seed, you're going to spread the composted seed mulch blend. You're making your own hydro mulch. So you spread that out as thin as you can almost get it. So I'll spread it over that garden space as best I can. Then I'll take my, my rake and I'll actually go tines up. So I've just got the flat bar at the top and I'll just scooch it around, trying to get it off, trying to get it in that garden space I've raked off, just trying to get it as smooth and as even as I can. That does a couple things. One, it ensures you get better seed to soil contact because now you've got mulch and that kind of stuff. It helps to keep the the birds off because they'll be pecking around going, oh, look, someone put a seed buffet out for us. It hides that seed for us. And as that soil freezes and thaws and heaves and receives that seed, it's receiving the seed, the mulch combined, adds a mild mulch, uh, nutrient to it, keeps it some moisture. There's a lot of benefit to that. But the main reason I came up with that years ago, I'm going, dang, I don't know where I spread the seed. How can I get around this? Oh, I'll just take a bag of mulch. I'll just spread the seed. Now I can actually see where I'm spreading my, my seed. It's like a game changer. It really helps. Now, when you're all done, I do actually spread a fertilizer and the, the insider tip, humic, H-U-M-I-C. This is humic acid. This is what makes seed germinate better and, and root deeper. So as those seed come up, They'll start showing in February, March, April. It's over a very long period. It feeds that seed root so it starts to, to, to root deeper. The deeper the root, the better the flower. The faster the flower, the stronger the plant, the better it will go through summer. Lots of benefits. I mean, I push this all the time for vegetable seeds, for flower seeds, but for wildflowers, it's one of the best. I mean, it's humic. And I'll just take my fertilizer. I'll take a 744 all-purpose fertilizer. Spread it out there. Then I take my humic. At the same time, I'll spread the seed, fertilizer, humic, done. That's how I do it. Uh, and, and over the next month or so, it'll settle and percolate. And the soil will heave and thaw and, and re grab those seed and, and bury them for you, really. And then you'll start to see seed come up. Now, here's the secret. When wildflowers start to come up, they sort of look like weeds. So be careful. Tell your gardener. If you had someone helping you or tell your husband where you planted these so that they try to keep the dog out of there. So you try to keep the birds off. So you want to mark it so you can see where you, where, where you did all this work back in the winter. Cause in the spring, it starts to become a little fuzzy or you forget where the lines are. Had a few snowstorms. The ground is heaved and thawed enough to where it all starts to look like this fluffy ground that you walk on. Those are things that'll really help you. I do water my seed in. I'd like to have that soil moist, not sopping wet. I'm not going to water it from this point on forward, but I do water it in pretty good. When I first put it in, I might hit it know, once a month through winter just to keep it moist. You know, usually we get enough moisture, snowstorms. These are all good things for wildflower seeds. It'll, you'll get enough just because you planted while we're getting these storm systems, some snow, and then it doesn't dry out as fast. It's just cooler. I'll start watering more when I start to see that seed germinate, when I'm starting to see green tops coming up, especially after each seed has gotten a second to fourth uh, leaf coming out, leaf nodes have opened up. I'm really sensitive to watch that. So I might water them. I don't overdo it. Maybe once a week, no more than twice, I'll just take a hose or I'll do a soaker hose. That's another little trick I did years ago. I went, I'm, I'm working mainly, raising four kids. I got a big family, a lot going on. What I did is I took a soaker hose and I actually buried it just slightly underneath the earth uh, where my wildflowers were going to go. I, I put it on a timer. So now timers are taking care of all of this. Soaker hose is out there. You know what I'm talking about. You know, the uh, uh, ground up tires, it's like, it's like rubber. They're black usually, real porous. And they start to seep as water goes through them. I buried that one underneath the ground. And then I turned it on. And wherever I saw a wet spot, that's where I put my wildflower seed. 
It was so easy just to take care of it. I didn't have to worry as much if you're really busy or you travel a lot. It's a great way to go. Yeah, it's a $10 hose. I buried it. I'm never going to use it again except for my hose in my wildflower patch. I can afford 10 bucks. And I put on a battery-operated timer onto my house, and that's how I watered uh, that patch probably for a couple of years. So that, that's a real good trick for vegetable gardens, for wildflower gardens. It just really takes the effort out of watering and caring for things. Just go, how often do I want it to water? Oh, I'll irrigate every four or five days. You set the clock that way, and away you go. it's battery-operated, away you go. But that's how you take wildflowers out there. That's how you put them down. That's the season you put it. This is when you do it. This is how you do it. And I'll, in fact, I'll print out some of these handouts. I'll have them waiting at the, uh, here at the Waters Garden Center at the front desk. They'll be available for you. If you can't find them online, Waters Garden Center, learn, garden tips. If you can't find it there, come in. I'll have one for you here. Uh, we're here to help you have a really great, prosperous 2019. Can you believe it's that time of the year? 2019 Year Gardens. Be right back with more. We'll wrap this thing up. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Lisa here with the Plants of the Week and our Arizona Gold Euonymus. An excellent choice for colored hedges and as tough as they come. This evergreen displays bold gold, head-high foliage that grows even thicker when sheared. A single shrub makes a bold statement for just $27, but in rows they make excellent visual and sound barriers. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love bold gold hedges, they love to shop. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Red Clusterberry Cotoneaster. Stunning white flowers cover the shrub in spring, then form red berries. A large evergreen that is tough, easy to grow, and tolerates poor soil. So thick when sheared, it's the perfect privacy for hot tubs, secluded entertainment areas, and prying eyes for just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love red berried Cotoneaster, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So I've got to tell you, some of you are way too gracious. <laughs> so I've had a lot of community events, some memorials. Some parties, celebrations, you know, at church or at wherever we're at. Uh, several, we've had this whole series of ugly sweater, not ads. They were just too fun for that. Posts. So we, we cut them, we videotaped them, put them onto YouTube, then copied them over to Instagram and Facebook. Just having fun. This is, this is where small independent garden centers, businesses can, can totally outpace, out personality, out service the big guys because we're in connection. We have we have resources and people and personality that can make our business fun. Well we I had this idea of ugly sweaters. Wouldn't that be fun? Had ran it through my team. They went out and bought a hideous, not an ugly sweater, a hideous sweater and a hideous hat to go with it. Said Ken, wear this and do the do your ugly sweater ad. And so I cert- it's, I did it mainly to go, yeah, you could get your spouse and you know uh, people in your lives an ugly sweater if they really want a sweater. But what a gardener really wants is a gift card to Waters. That was the whole premise. And then the team had fun with it. And they had me doing cactus and poinsettias and <laughs> they, here, do this, do this. <laughs> so, and some of you have been watching that. Thank you very much for being so gracious and kind. It was purely to poke fun. Mainly the staff did it purely to poke fun at me, <laughs> which is fun. I like that. And I'm a ham. I never met a microphone I didn't like. And so we just went through and had fun with it. Thank you for doing that. You want to take a look at those. Several of them are still up on the Facebook, you know, the Waters Garden Center Facebook feed or Instagram account. You'll find it. Type in Waters Gardens. It'll come up. Or I'm sure my assistant put it on YouTube. That's kind of the, the where you start 
and you get the URL and you post it to where you need it to be so anyone can see it. So it's already gotten hundreds of, of views, hundreds and hundreds of views, but you all have been commenting on that. Uh, but really, if you want to buy your spouse or skimp and others an ugly sweater, go ahead. But if not, if they're a gardener, they'd rather have a gift card to Waters. Uh, we know it's winter. They understand it's not a big, bold, hanging basket. But hey, it's they'll plan for it. That's kind of the gist of it. Uh, next week, I'm going to go deep onto the holiday trees that are hard to kill. So if you don't want a cut tree, you want living trees, you want evergreens, you need more evergreens out in the yard, I'm going to go over the varieties, their pros and their cons. More than just Colorado spruce, that's the one that if people come in and go, I don't know the name of it, but my neighbor has one and it looks like a Christmas tree. Oh yeah, let's show you. It's this one. It's always a Colorado spruce. But there are so many more choices than that. So I was just walking our neighborhood, and, and one of the neighbors had this stunning Vanderwolf pine, had dressed it up, had little balls on it. It's out in the yard. It's right there at the corner of, of two streets. It was magnificent. It screamed happy holidays or Merry Christmas or, gosh, I'm just glad it's I have this tree in the yard, and I like to decorate with red balls. It screamed of that. There's a whole series of plants you can put out in the yard. That really looks good. Yes, you could use them as a Christmas tree if you wanted, but probably that's already been done at this point. But what are some other evergreens you could plant now that would be so hardy, so tough that, that you couldn't kill them, yet you could dress them up and it just screams, I love winter. So that's that's the plan for next week. We'll get the word out on that. If you want to take a look at that Vanderwolf pine, I did actually take a picture of that and posted that on Instagram. I know that's mainly a younger person's platform, but it's pretty fun. You can see mainly photos. You can post it. Just look at Waters Gardens, and it'll be right there. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Gardens, and we love talking friends about wildflowers, holiday plants, evergreens, whatever. Let us know you heard the show. Just say hi. May we wish you and yours the merriest of Christmas and the happiest of holidays. And next week, I'll start saying prosperous new year the mountain gardener your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of arizona with local garden expert and the mountain gardener himself ken lane listen in every week for ken's tips tricks and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season look if your wife mom or dad wants a sweater for christmas get them a sweater not some piece of plastic but if someone you truly care about loves her garden, a gift card to Waters makes perfect sense. Next spring, she can pick out exactly what she was hoping for. We all know it's not the same thing as a huge hanging basket or a fragrant rose, but hey, it's winter. Gardeners understand. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Also at watersgardencenter.com. Okay, maybe after decades of the same fruitcake exchange, it's time to start a new holiday tradition. A living Christmas tree from Waters Garden Center can be decorated and enjoyed for a lifetime, not just a season. When the holiday festivities end, gather family and friends and plant your tree together for years of enjoyment. Or Waters will plant it for you, guaranteed. As your family tree grows, have a tree that grows with your family. From Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.